and welcome to this, the first in what we hope will be a series of Southeast Mid of Southeast Midlands Branch technical meetings using Zoom. Things don't seem to be changing that quickly that we can anticipate anything else. And so for the time being, they will replace our physical meetings that uh, we're, we're used to. Uh, they seem to have worked well for lunchtime meetings that the EI agree have been running over the past few months. And uh, certainly I've joined a couple of those and it's been very enjoyable. This evening, however, it's my pleasure, great pleasure to welcome Martin Oldman as our speaker. Martin is extremely well qualified to speak on the topic of seed treatment, a subject which occupied his career from 1982 to 2015 with Bayer. He started with the company just after they'd launched the Baytan seed treatment, a revolutionary systemic fungicide. His work has mainly focused on seed treater design and build, not only for the UK, but for markets around the world. And within his work, he was responsible for a patented design of a flow metering system, and also the monitoring and control of the quality of seed treatment application by all UK processors. He will no doubt have some insider information on the neonics issue. Latterly, uh, Martin establishes a seed process consultancy and has undertaken projects for Bayer, crop science in the US and UK, and as an expert witness in some patent ap application work. All in all, as I said earlier, it would be hard to find anyone more qualified to speak on tonight's subject of seed treatment. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Tim. I suppose I should attempt to share my screen. That's there it. Yeah. yeah. Share computer sound. Good. Well, thank you very much for your introduction, Tim. Uh, and thank you for those of you who uh, turned up tonight. Uh, I mean, few people can have been so lucky as to see such incredible advances in technology as I've seen during my career in seed treatment application. Uh, consequently, when I came to put this presentation together, I found that I'd rather a large amount of material, as you can understand. So I spent the last couple of weeks cutting large chunks out of it. Um, I hope what remains um, hangs together sensibly and will prove of some interest to you all. There may be those of you who have some knowledge of seed treatments already, uh, and I must apologize to you for what I've left out. Um, but then again, for those who have no knowledge of it, maybe I should apologize for what I've left in. Um, either way, uh, let's, have a, uh, let's move on. Uh, hopefully you can see that screen there. Um, firstly, uh, I will possibly introduce, um, sensibly introduce what seed treatments are, because there's no point looking at technology unless you understand what it is we're trying to, to achieve and the products that we're using. Then we'll have a look at some of the machinery, some of the traditional seed treaters that have been used, the product metering equipment, uh, and then machine development, and get some idea of the processing plants that uh, this equipment is, is used in. Then the quality, um, it's very important once you've got the seed treatment applied, uh, you need to be able to assess the quality of what has been, the work's been done. And then we'll get on to looking a little bit at maize and uh, one or two of the issues that arose around uh, maize uh, in Europe. Um, brief look at the neo nick debate that I'm sure many of you will have heard a lot about. <clears throat> and finally, uh, a bit of a summary just to sum up and see where we've been. So what are seed treatments? Well, you've got a number of problems, issues need to address with seed treatments. And the first is, is this traditional seed borne diseases. These can be carried in or on the seed and transferred from a parent uh, uh, to, to, to seedling. Um, and over the generations, these can build up to quite substantial losses, even in some cases, crop losses. Uh, and these are traditionally things like loose smut and bugs and, and, and leaf strife. But then you have the plant and root pests, uh, where we can either protect with a halo around the seed, a halo of influence from a, uh, 
product or a systemic product that's taken up by the seedling and protects the growing plants from pests and diseases. For example, uh, uh, aphids, uh, yellow rust, fusarium and tegel. Um, and then we also need particularly increasingly these days to, con to consider growth stimulants, uh, micronutrients, uh, biologicals, colors, and of course, coatings. All of these are usually applied to seed as either liquids, powders, or in some cases, they're not so often in this country as, uh, as a slurry mix. So looking back to the 70s, and actually um, this is more than 30 years ago now, I dread to think, but um, those of you who were about in those days may well remember SPD, single purpose dressing. It was so cheap that rig, uh, for one or two pounds a ton that normally it wasn't even charged for, but it controlled seaborne disease in loose smut, uh, in barley and bunt in wheat, mostly organomercury products, um, powders or solvents. Now, uh, of course, the solvents were used to create a true liquid, uh, and the solvents carried this li mercury liquid in through the seed coat. Uh, of course, they quite successfully carried it in through your skin, should you happen to get any on you. So not a particularly nice product to handle. Then there's dual purpose dressing, control of wireworm, DPD, as it's generally known. And that uh, used products such as gamma HCH, which again, as you'd understand, was not a particularly nice product to handle. Uh, and then wheat bulb fly, uh, trithion, carbophenophion, uh, not a very nice product to handle. Again, uh, you get the gist of what's going on here. Uh, and then in the late 70s, um, ICI introduced Milstem Ethyramol, which was the first product to really go in systemically and control barley. Uh, this is really my first introduction to seed treatments and the possibility that there could ever be a problem with it. Uh, I was working as an agricultural merchant in Bedford at the time, Pilgrim Feeds, part of the Spillers Group, um, and I sold some seed corn to a customer, Cotton End actually, and he came and complained to me that uh, he didn't think his mill stem was applied properly. So I contacted my supplier, uh, seed plant at Morton in Essex, which is still there to this day. And, um, uh, but they came back to me and said, look, we've got this new Rotostat seed treater from ICI. It's got all these interlocks. It, it can't put out seed that isn't properly treated. So I, I got back onto the customer and uh, we were both quite convinced about that. Um, now, all of these products, as, you, as, we, as I was saying, they're not particularly um, nice products to handle, but as during the 90s, uh, things like toxicity and environmental concerns started, they all disappeared. Um, and we were left more and more with uh, the systemic seed treatments. Now, systemic seed treatments are one of the most focused crop protection methods available. If you look at it, the seed treatment goes onto the seed. You've got about 1% of the AI of, of, um, uh, of using a spray treatment. So if you can control your, your aphids or whatever um, with uh, a seed treatment, that is, is much the best way to do it. They also have less impact on non-target or organisms. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, seed treatments are applied in a controlled environment. You bear in mind they're being used in a seed plant, um, an equipment that can, that can be monitored uh, easily and uh, by experienced operators. So a high level of application quality can be achieved. Well, that's in the seed plant. Let's just take a look and see where the seed treater fits into a seed plant. Uh, we may well have people with us tonight who, who understand grain handling and are regularly involved with it. This is a, a small schematic of uh, what you might find in the seed plant. Let's just run through it. You have an intake, obviously, where the seed goes in. You then have your sieve cleaners uh, that I'm sure you know separate out the seed by width. Then you have your cylinders that select by length uh, and then maybe a gravity table, though increasingly actually you have color sources going into seed plants. Uh, and this separates the seed out by specific weight for the light and the heavy ones and so on. Finally, we have our seed treater and then into a bagging unit uh, on a weigher. These days increasingly, 500 kilo or one ton belt bags. Of course, connecting all of these, you'll have elevators and often holding bins, they're not always. Um, many seed plants 
have the equipment stacked up. So the treater will be above the weigher. The treater may be on the first floor. Uh, the gravity table may, may be below the cylinders, for example, uh, and there may be large holding bins. But importantly, as anyone involved with, with brain handling would understand, the downstream equipment needs to have a higher throughput than the upstream equipment so that you reduce the chance of blockages. Bearing in mind, if your gravity table is working faster than your treater, then you're likely to get a gradual build up and then something's got to give. So your treater may be operating at 20 tons an hour and your gravity table at 15 tons an hour. So you've always got the seed treaters waiting for seed. Now this is quite important because I will refer to this uh, stopping and starting of the seed treater uh, when we get to look at some of the machines. So, Back in the day, how well were these seed treatments applied? Now, some of you may be old enough to remember ADAS leaflets. Um, ADAS leaflet 816, Principles of Serial Seed Treatment, 1982. Uh, well, they looked at commercial loadings actually from 1967, which is going back even further. Uh, let me present the results. I mean, they're horrendous, quite honestly. Only 15% had more than 50% of the target dose. Uh, it makes you wonder why people were wasting their time putting it on. Uh, and many of us back in the day will remember uh, the sight of loose smut in, 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 in Bali in sort of April, May time. Um, the smutted ears sticking up uh, and also the bunts, spores sticking to combines at harvest time. Uh, quite a common sight. So if it was that bad, what should a seed tree to have been doing? <clears throat> Firstly, it needs to weigh or meter the seed so you know what's going through the machine. Then you need to meter the seed treatment products. I mean, if you're spraying, the weighing or metering the seed is like your ground speed. You need to meter the treatment products is like your nozzle output. And you've got to combine the two. You then need some way of uh, injecting or atomizing the products so that the two get together uh, and then some sort of mixing. Well, that's fairly straightforward to achieve, actually, in many situations. It's the also's where the problems start to occur. It needs to be easy to set up. The operator needs to be able to, to calibrate and check the seed throughput and the product calibration. You also need to be able to tackle long and short runs, bearing in mind that a seed lot may be 30, 35 tonnes. And if you're running that through nonstop, you've got a fairly consistent throughput. But if uh, a customer comes on and, and wants half a ton, three quarters of a ton of seed, you've got a very short run. And of course, this it comes back to this stop start, as I was saying earlier. I've seen seed treaters turning on and off every 20 seconds because they're slow feed into the treater. And this can have drastic consequences for continuous uh, throughput machine. And finally, of course, ease of clean down. Uh, so when you change the seed lot, or particularly uh, if you're changing variety, you don't want to have contamination um, uh, between one seed lot to the next. Well, I'm just going to run through a few of the early seed treaters uh, uh, briefly, um, normally classified by the, the type of mixer they employed. You have continuous mixers uh, where the seed is metered in continuously as long as it's available. Um, uh, they into some sort of mix, mixer and then the batch treaters where the seed is put in in short, small batches, uh, 50 kilos, 150 kilos or whatever uh, to mix, and they're much easier to calibrate. Let's have a look at one or two of these then. Firstly, you've got a rotating drum system. Uh, you, you may know them from Gustafson days. They used predominantly anyone who works overseas will have seen these uh, drum treaters, uh, now manufactured by Bayer in the, in the States. And I'll just run through one or two points uh, to you. Stop, start. Now, at the top there is a, um, uh, is a, just let me get my laser pointer organized. There we are. That is a grain sensor. So that is sensing that seed is available. Now, when seed is available, it starts the paddle wheel rotating. And that paddle wheel rotates, dispenses seed by volume into the machine. You then have to think about calibration and calibration the chemical. They provide a, a, a meter a calibration station here, so you can measure the output of the liquid. This is a, a, a machine from a brochure, so you haven't got all the pipes and the bits and pieces shown there. 
atomization, the chemical then goes down this tube here onto an atomizing disc, which is quite successful. Mixing for larger seeds, if you do maize or cotton seed, for example, uh, that's quite satisfactory for constant long runs. Not too convinced. I haven't seen any, well, I, as far as I know, these haven't been used in the UK, to my knowledge, um, on this scale, but they seem to be quite uh, used quite regularly throughout uh, the States and certainly in Africa and places. Clean down, you have to wait for the um, seed to, to, to come out of the end of this as an inclined drum. And then if there's been any deposits on the inside, you then have to somehow get in and scrape out any residue. So that's rotating drums. That's the only one I've covered there. Let's move on to organ mixing. Let's start with, <laughs> with one here. This is a photo I took, I think, in about the 80s, somewhere up near Kim Bolton. A box of Mogamma powder. Uh, you trickle it in the auger as you uh, feed it into the drill. Well, calibration? No, I think not. Um, mixing? I don't know. Um, anyway, we'll move on from that to an ICI plant tech. So this is one of the early machines. You've got a, an infeed hopper here that the seed goes into, mixing auger here, and the bag off point here. This has been uh, obviously taken out of the seed plant. Um, generally are difficult to take photos of in the seed plant because they're surrounded by other bits of kit. I'll overlay on that a little diagram. Pressure switch. So when the seed flows in, the pressure switch operates and starts the paddle wheel. Now, unfortunately, this is not a nice discrete volumetric paddle wheel because there's a little gap underneath it and the seed can trickle around it. So you can't say that that provides a swept volume into the machine. It's more like an agitator that encourages the machine into the mixer. So calibration can be a bit of a challenge to know what your seed throughput is. Atomizing, well, on this machine, this particular uh, diagram, there is no atomization. You're simply relying on a powder feeder feeding in here. But later machines did have an, a, an atomizing disc uh, built into here where the chamber was really too small to get successful atomization. Mixing, inclined auger quite successful, uh, but again, so it didn't crush peas and beans and that sort of thing. There was a maybe a uh, 20, 15, 20 mil gap between the edge of the auger and the outside of the auger uh, uh, casing, which meant that when you came to clean down, uh, you had maybe 15, 20 kilos of unmixed seed to dispose of. Norigard, Kennegard goes back to the Panagin days. This is a quite successful range of seed treaters. They make them in all different sizes from maybe four tons an hour to 25 tons an hour, all working on very similar principles. Um, uh, I won't bore you too much with this because I've got a diagram in a moment. Behind here, this control panel is a metering, seed metering unit we'll look at. This marvelous arrangement here are metering pumps and underneath you have mixing orders. And let's have a look at a diagram on top of that, which again is perhaps equally complicated. But suffice to say, up here is the infeed. And you have a probe there, which senses when seed's available. This here is a metering wheel, like a water wheel. You can just make out that there are discrete volumes here. And actually, that is a sweeping brush that makes sure that you are dispensing a discrete volume into the seed trees. In fact, it's so good at doing this that you can say uh, that, for example, every 10 revs, you have one hectolitre of, of seed. That means that if you know the hectolitre weight, say 75 kilos, you know that for every rev, you've got 7.5 kilos. So you can then calibrate your pumps accordingly. Uh, we won't go into that because, as you see, it's quite complex. So calibration is relatively simple. And even actually, the pumps are linked to the paddle wheel. So if you adjust the speed ranger knob, the paddle wheel goes faster and the pumps go faster to keep the chemical in tune with it. Atomizing disc here, that's a basket actually there. That's quite successful. And a mixing auger here, it's horizontal and they're crescent blades. Um, so providing it's full, you get fairly good mixing. If it's stopping and starting, it can be batting the seed about um, and it may not be well treated. Clean down. You have to pull the end of the mixing auger out um, in order to, to, to clean, clean out in, in, the, uh, in the auger shaft and um, <clears throat> you will have grain to dispose of. 
Now I've put this one in because it's an interesting machine actually, mainly because it was designed at um, Silso, Rest Park. Um, here you've got a mixing auger, but the bit we're interested in is what's going on inside this red box. And here I have a rather bad uh, diagram, I'm afraid, but let's see how we go. Stop, start. You have, it says control sleeve there. This is actually a collar that when seed's available, uh, an electromagnet operates and lift this collar. So seed will flow down here onto this cone here, which has got load cells on the end of it. So it actually weighs, it's a continuous way. It's weighing the throughput of the seed. Well, that's great. If you set this machine up to say do 20 tons an hour, after a little while, it senses what the throughput is. And then a stepper motor on this top collar adjusts the collar up and down to achieve the right throughput. When, so when it's adjusted it, it then reassesses the throughput um, and adjusts the collar a bit more until you've got your 20 tons an hour which is fine unless in that time you've run out of seed and the collar shuts. And then when you get more seed come back again in the infeed bin, it starts again and you have to get, so there's a chance with this machine that if you've got a stop start situation, that the, you get an awful lot of hunting of the collar moving up and down, trying to get the seed to flow right. So calibration, you rely on the presets that when you press 20 tons an hour, that's what it's going to achieve for you. Atomization or good atomizing disc there, which is quite good. Mixing inclined auger you saw and clean down can be a bit of a challenge if you've got to clean out a mixing auger. So that's auger mixing there. Let's have a look at the um, uh, batch mixing. Uh, this is the ICI Rotostat. Uh, it was a very famous machine for anyone involved in seed treatments because it was designed by um, ICI Jim Ellsworth at, and his team at Fernhurst. Um, and uh, went on for many, many years, very successful. Um, you have, we we'll look more closely at the batch mixing process in a moment, but the mixture is inside here. You have a mechanical weigher. So that's your weigher hopper there. On the back, you've got a balance beam with your weights in there. It discharges into this spout here, which in the first versions went straight into the bag. So you have a 50 kilo, or in those days, 100 weight bag, ready treated with seed, straight ready for sale. So this is looking inside it. You've got up here um, a weigher. And of course, it's very good for stop start because it won't treat unless it's got your target weight in, which might be 50 kilos. Seed meter is reliable. You can check the weight simply by passing it through the machine and putting your bag of seed on a set of scales. And you know, then you've got 50 kilos and you can then calibrate your, your metering system because to your 50 kilo target rate. rate. Atomizing is good. You've got an atomizing disc in there uh, and we'll look more closely at this rotating uh, uh, rotor here that throws the seed out into the seed wall and mixes it. Uh, mixing is excellent um, and clean down is quite straightforward because it throws it out of the door and there's very little residue unless you've got some mishap or over treatment inside the seed treater body. Now, the ICI or Bayer Vanguard, I say ICI Bayer because in 1998, Bayer bought the, what was by then the Zeneca seed treatment business and uh, assumed ownership of all these machines. Um, uh, that is a mixing drum. Hopefully there's a video and I hope you should be able to see it. I'll, I'll play it and then we can have a little chat about it afterwards. The seed is spun up the fixed walls by the rotor. The two fixed angled spoilers turn the seed back into the center of the mixer where they're recycled, ensuring excellent mixing. When completed, the guillotine door in the side of the chamber is opened and the seed discharged into the weigher below. The chemical we saw being connected is sprayed onto the seed by the stainless steel spinning disc mounted in the middle of the chamber. As the treatment is applied, the seed changes color and the chemical application is completed in approximately eight seconds. It's a rather nice bit of video. Actually, it was shot a number of years ago, but um, we're still using very much, Bayer is still using very much the same mixing principle now. So if we look stop-start, I mean, like the road stack, it's very good. You've got a wear here, 
which, um, which won't put any seed in the mixing chamber unless it's got the target rate in. Um, it's a single point load cell on a cantilever beam. And there you've got the, uh, the screen to uh, check calibration and input your target weight. Calibration is quite straightforward because once you've got your target weight, you can then check the amount of chemical that you're putting in and make sure that it matches that target. Atomization, like the rotostat, was, was, is very good inside the mixing chamber you saw in the video. Uh, mixing is very flexible, and this is very important with the Vanguard because it, you are able to, uh, to vary the mixing cycle depending on what you're trying to do, which is something you can't do or can only do with difficulty with a continuous throughput machine. You can do sequential mixing. And one of the things with all seed rape, which uh, was able to be done, was applying uh, the liquid uh, seed treatment initially, and then allowing that to mix for four or five seconds, then applying a powder coating, um, sort of incrustation material, uh, and allowing that to mix for a while uh, before discharging it. So you have these sequentially, you can do all sorts of build ups and so on with it. Quite a, a, an exceptional machine. Clean down again, straightforward. Finally, on batch mixes, here's one that I think might interest one or two of you. Pedal treater. Just briefly run through this. Um, you, you obviously you pedal like fury, you rotate the handlebar to the left, and that puts your batch of seed into the mixing chamber. You then pull this lever, which squirts your dose of chemical into the chamber. When you've pedaled it enough, you rotate the handlebar to the right, and that puts the seed out of the mixer into the bucket. I'm never, not sure whether it, this was ever actually used in, in, in anger in the field, but uh, it was always quite fun to, to use as a demonstration. So that's a brief overview of the sort of the machines and you get an idea now of what a machine is meant to do, how it's meant to function in a process. Um, let's look at the product metering, diaphragm pumps. Uh, many of you will know diaphragm pumps. You've got uh, a motor there. Uh, with a gearbox and a pump head with ball valves in and out. Look a bit more closely. Uh, that's uh, looking inside the gearbox, but even more closely perhaps would be useful. There you have the adjuster and the adjuster alters the length of the stroke. This spring here is what pulls the diaphragm back and pulls the chemical into the chamber here. If you adjust that up, it stops the spring from returning completely. So you have a lost motion pump here, um, so, which means obviously you're going to get some sort of pulsation. So the features of the pump are that really you need a flood, flooded suction. If you're trying to use this diaphragm to suck chemical up any distance or against any uh, suction pressure, this diaphragm is likely to deform and vary your output. Ball valves are prone to blockages, particularly if you're dealing with suspension liquids as, uh, as, 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 as we are in the business and the seed trade. However, positive pressure is very good at delivering uh, into the seed treater against maybe four or five, possibly six bar. Um, so you can have these pumps on the ground floor delivering up to the seed treater, which may be a floor to a bar. Now, if you've got that pulsation, you obviously need, ideally, for, particularly for a continuous throughput machine, you need to have some sort of pulsation damping to smooth the flow. But if you're absorbing some of the pulse into the pulsation damper when you stop, you should have a solenoid shut off so you don't get a continuous dribble on and that can go into the seed, tra seed treater and contaminate the machine. Someone then has to come and, uh, and, and scrape it out. So to get over all these issues, um, when Bayer were going to introduce Baytan liquid, they decided that really they should uh, look at the system and come up with their own metering system. And the marvelous Bayer pumping system uh, was put together. Um, I think a lot of the involvement with a guy called Matt Roberts, very much uh, influential in this, and it was really very impressive. You had you need a 10 litre wine box of packs. So you no, no longer had drums. Uh, one or two of you may be sitting there with a glass of wine out of a wine box, uh, but you've got a cardboard box with a flexible inner liner that's suspended in this pack. As they emptied, they got lighter and they lifted up by, were lifted up by springs. So that meant that you had a constant head about here of the level of the liquid. So you provided a flooded suction. 
Let's have a little bit closer look at the unit here. We've got a filter at the back, just in case any contamination or any particles were in the seed treatment, that should stop the pore valves clogging up. You've got twin pump heads that enabled you to add water, which, which was a way of controlling uh, the, the, the quality of the final mix. So you could add extra liquid to ensure complete distribution on the seed. Delivery pressure was monitored high and low. Now, if the bore valves blocked, obviously the pressure would drop. If uh, the delivery line became blocked, the, the pressure would rise. Both of these situations would, 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 um, uh, uh, would have safety cutouts and stop the seed treat. Calibration timer, so the operator could check calibration, uh, low chemical float switch. So all of these faults uh, would stop the treater. So that was involving um, uh, diaphragm pumps, which is one thing, but then uh, seed uh, uh, peristaltic pumps started to become more and more involved uh, in, the, in the seed trade. Peristaltic pumps, you may know, um, very flexible pumps. Here you've got a rotating pump head um, and a variable speed adjuster here. Let's have a look more closely. These are two low, two roller pump heads on this diagram. You've got three rollers, but the principle's the same. <clears throat> They're not true positive displacement. If you think about it, uh, it came as a bit of a realization to me that you have this volume of liquid here, you are rotating round and then pushing up into your seed trees. That's fine, but how does that volume get there? You rely on that piece of tube expanding after the roller has gone past it. Now that expansion can vary depending on the temperature of well, obviously vary the elasticity of the tube, whether the tube is warm. Um, if you're sucking out of a barrel, for example, the difference in, 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 in suction, uh, in negative pressure required from the top to the bottom of the barrel means your output or the amount coming into this tube can vary between the top of the barrel and the bottom. Low delivery pressure, you try and force it up to a seed treater up two floors up, up above, and you find that you can reach a maximum throughput and no matter how fast you turn it, no more will come out because it can't get through the tube and the tube deforms and the product flows back round the rollers. So hang on, we've got a system, uh, no ball valves to get contaminated, that's excellent. And tube is easy to change in some seed plants, particularly the smaller ones, they can have one pump maybe two or three lines and just swap the tube between one uh, and another. But if you had this on the ground floors, as some of the, uh, the uh, diaphragm pumps were, trying to meter up to the seed treater, you can't lift it that high. You put it up by the seed treater and it can't suck it up that high. So what do you do? You build a transfer system. And on the ground floor, you have little flow jet double diaphragm air pumps by cheap and cheerful, but very good at handling the products uh, in a fairly controlled way. Then on the top floor, you have little reservoirs. And these little reservoirs are linked up to your peristaltic pumps. So when the reservoir empties out, because this pump say is running, the pump downstairs starts and fills it up again. So you can have continuous operation of the peristaltic pump because it never runs out of liquid. If it does, if the barrel runs dry, again, the fault stops the seed trees. So that's the uh, transfer system, that's the peristaltic pumps. There's one other pumping system I guess we should look at historically, it was very interesting, and this was the volumetric jars that ICI produced for many years. Uh, here you have um, a reinforced glass jar. Underneath it, you have an inlet and outlet valve, and above it, you have an arrangement of pneumatics for uh, suction and air pressure. I'll just overlay on that little diagram. Um, you draw in product through here, and it rises up until it reaches the high level probe. Then it stops, it's a capacitance probe. When you get to the right time in the process cycle and it calls for chemical, you put air pressure in the top and you push the chemical into the treater out through this valve here until it uncovers the bottom probe then it refills and goes around the cycle. So very good positive displacement pump um, uh, and worked very reliably. No float switches, so very little to get blocked up. 
However, prone to liquid sensitive problems, if you get a product that is prone to dry out or maybe is uh, not a good conductor, it can overfill. Uh, and a hint might be the, 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 the plethora of overflow pr probes in this system. If it doesn't stop on this one and it goes out through the top into this jar here, this brings the whole uh, process uh, to a crashing halt. Um, so, so yeah, it was, there were some issues with these from time to time. Could be prone to mechanical blockages. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, times was when you got uh, a, a suction on the air, on the, an air leak on the suction side. That would create a foam inside this chamber here. And when you put a vacuum onto a foam, all the air bubbles expand. And it touches this probe and it thinks it's full. When you put pressure onto a foam, all the air bubbles collapse. And so it thinks it's gone into the seed treater. But all you've done is, uh, is expand and compress um, a foam. Now, we know the volume that we're trying to put on the seed. And then some clever chap, I think it was a guy called David Cheney, decided that maybe we should weigh it before putting it onto the seed. And that would save using all these nasty volumetric pumps. So this was a, a very interesting project. And it ended up uh, with quite a complex system, as you'll see here. Uh, this is two chemical wear modules. Let's look a bit more closely at it because it's a bit confusing. And that's still very confusing, actually. Well, so I'll highlight one or two things, hopefully. Here you have a load cell. Connected to this load cell, you have a way chamber. Above the way chamber, you've got four inlet valves. So when you want a product, an inlet valve opens and fills the chamber until it has the right weight of product in there. You can then, of course, add a second product should you want a co-application or even a third and a fourth if, that, if you're so inclined. Then when you've got the right quantity of product in there, you open the outlet valve and that allows all the product in the weigh chamber to drop to the discharge chamber. Then at the right time in the cycle, when you want your product in the mixer, you put pressure on the, that chamber and it injects the chemical into the mixer. By which time the weigh chamber is filled up with the next batch. So as soon as that batch has gone, the outlet valve opens and drops the next batch into the discharge chamber, ready for the next cycle. So really uh, quite a, a, an accurate uh, and reliable way of doing it, but as you see, a little complicated. I suppose that the, the pinnacle of this was um, 2007 in Australia. This is a range of six weighing systems on one line on a seed treater. There were two seed treaters, 1,000 meter rotary batch treaters on cotton seed. There were six modules per treater, allowed you 24 product lines per treater. Now, that's not all insecticides and fungicides. They had his adhesive six stickers and colors, bearing in mind that uh, they were using a hybrid or, or GM seed. And so they needed to keep the traits very well separated and so the place was run to almost uh, clinical cleanliness. Every last cotton seed was picked up off the floor if anything was spilt, and they needed to keep the trait separate, particularly identified by color on the seed. Uh, one of the most important things with this installation was that previously they had been using slurry mixes when they would mix up a thousand liters of slurry. If they then went to process the batch and they found that only actually after all the cleaning and everything got 15 tons, that five tons worth of slurry to get rid of, as well as anything that had been got solid overnight or this sort of thing, it was costing them millions of Australian dollars a year to dispose of the waste product from the slurry mixer. With this, of course, all you had in all those systems was the next batch. And the system was so arranged so when it knew it was reaching the end of the production cycle, it would use the last batch and then hold empty. So that was a very, very good system. But while this was going on, we were doing a lot of work with electromagnetic flow meters. Very simple, very straightforward, a simple lump like that with a hole in it. It works on Faraday's law. Some of you may well be aware of these. Um, you have magnets here, produce a magnetic field, 
across the bore of the ceramic tube where your liquid is flowing. You have cermet, uh, ceramic metal composite electrodes on either side, and they produce a voltage proportional to the velocity of flow. Brilliant. No obstruction to product flow, so nothing to get clogged up, no moving parts, nothing to break down or wear out, easy to install and change. Reliable calibration they actually come with a, albeit a water, calibration certificate. Cheap, well, relative to a pump, actually, quite cheap. And a sealed unit. You can see that, interestingly, that unit there is welded stainless steel. No serviceable parts, I'm afraid. Uh, it might be seem a waste, but they are designed to be used for uh, for, for filling um, uh, systems which are clean in place, sterilized in place systems, uh, where you can't have any nooks or crannies um, to carry over any contamination. <clears throat> However, they're really for use in conductive liquids. It was interesting, actually, because I listened to Daniel Heft from Realty on the 15th of September at his IAGRI uh, chat, and he was quite disparaging of electromagnetic flow meters. He suggested they gave out random flow numbers, I think might have been his comment. Um, uh, but I think there's something 250, 300 of these in service in the last uh, uh, 10 plus years. Remarkably reliable, uh, remarkably accurate, certainly comparable with anything else in the seed processing system. So what do we do with these? We, we put these, of course, in a module. You might be getting a hint of how things tend to be done. Modules are a very useful way of, of, of installing equipment. Uh, let's look inside, take the cover off. We have a double diaphragm air pump. We like those, they're very useful. They uh, handle products very nicely. We then put a, have a flow meter in the line, a solenoid valve to give us a sharp, shut off when we want it and pressure control and that controls the rate of flow uh, so that we get our batch into the seed treater um, within maybe six eight seconds or whatever our target time is then there's a local control screen here to for, to set up the parameters uh, unless it's installed in a seed um, <clears throat> uh, uh, integrated network seed process system where it gets its, its control uh, uh, from the main seed treater. Okay, so we've now looked pretty thoroughly at some product metering. If we now have a look at where we were going on seed treaters. The seed treat development, the last one the things you saw was the Vanguard and the Rotostat. Um, well, the final um, uh, evolution of the seed treater was the evolution. Uh, interestingly, uh, this had, I suppose you cl class it as a modular assembly. It allows tailored installation. You've got all of the parts here. Because you have a, a circular drum here, you can rotate these parts in, in any position around the, the diameter, around the circumference of this. So it means you can look at your seed plant and decide where you want, for example, your, dis your, your uh, chemical, your, your seed discharged into. Uh, where the elevator is, uh, where the infeed is, and where the dust extraction is, and design the arrangements to suit your individual seed plants. <clears throat> Three point load, so you can see here one, two, and the third one on the back give you a very positive uh, weighman. Came in two sizes, 800 or 1000 mil rotors, handling 65 or up to 150 kilo batches, something like 30 tons an hour. <clears throat> Side opening discharge door. Might not be very important to you, but if we could gain one second on the cycle time, that could gain us something like two tons an hour in process capacity. Network control, data capture, is touch screen control for the control and all the inputs, uh, your target doses and all this sort of thing, and uh, preset recipes so that you can decide how much mix time and so on he wants for particular uh, combinations of product. Um, so part of the, uh, of the involvement to design this machine was um, uh, modeling. Now, this was computer modeling. Some of you may be aware of computer modeling where every particle, it's not just CGI, it's not just computer graphics, every particle is plotted, monitored, all the forces acting on that particle are known and calculated 
and even the distribution of seed treatment from one particle to another um, <clears throat> was modeled. This is a model of the speed within the mixer. Within the mixer. Uh, and you can see the red is the fast speed, uh, the blue the slowest speed. And you can see the, um, uh, the, the, the velocity gradient across the mixer here. One of the most interesting things was that it proved the efficiency of the polyurethane coating that was used on the rotor. Um, this was actually uh, a part of the pretty much the original design by Jim Ellsworth, and it's, it's um, that says a lot for, for, for his um, expertise in that so little had to be changed. Um, polyurethane coating, when it's damp, has a very good um, uh, uh, friction coefficient to drive the seed uh, around the mixing chamber. It also enables us to, to look at and modify the angle of the, of the mixing spoiler at the back here to throw the right amount of seed in to keep the, the rotor clean and to stop any build up on the center uh, where uh, there is little uh, movement of the seed. A lot of this work was done up at a test center at Wickham Market. There's another little video here, which uh, on the right hand side, which hopefully will play. You can see the spoiler there and you can see how it uh, moves the seed. The discharge door is actually at the top, so you don't see that. Uh, there's no chemical being applied, but you'll see how the seed flows and see how quickly it empties and how clean the mixing chamber is. This is a new rotor, so that orange color is not contamination from, from uh, seed treatment. Uh, that is the color of the original polyurethane. I mean, it's hardly a grain in there, that's, and that's how it, how it should stay. So you know at the end of every cycle, all the seed is discharged and, uh, and you're ready for the next batch. So we now have the machine developed. Uh, let's have a quick look at one or two seed plants and see, see how this installs into, uh, into, a, into a, a real a static plant. Um, so this is an evolution treater connected with two flow meters. The flow meters are linked, networked with the seed treater, so that when you select the batch volume, it automatically um, selects the right product that you've selected from the flow meters and um, decides what quantity, what volume of uh, product you, you ask for on the seed. Uh, so it's adjusted for seed batch size. Now, every batch is recorded and summarized, the date, the time, the seed lot reference, uh, seed batch weight, the product batch volume, and so on. At the end of each, each, each job, the whole job is totalized. And uh, so you know how much seed has been produced, how much product has been used uh, for each seed production run. This is another processing plant. Uh, these are actually two quantum seed treaters that were the sort of forerunner of the, of the evolution. Again, large 150 kilo uh, thousand mil rotors, uh, four flow meter sets put in, and these replaced the peristaltic pumps that were in there. You can see the, the lines here come down from the uh, transfer uh, reservoirs on the floor above into the flow meters. This is another static seed processing plant, uh, looks quite involved. This is looking head on into it, um, and it's identical left and right. Over on the right, you have your chemical storage, where all the IBCs and the, the drums will be put, and flow jet pumps transfer the chemical through the lines that are in this tube up to the reservoirs on the top floor. The reservoirs then feed down to the treaters, uh, where the um, metering system is as well. Uh, then the seed is discharged up this elevator and down to the bag off lines. If you have any farmers amongst the, uh, the audience this evening, you may well use a mobile processing plant. Well, this is the sort of system that you might have on your farm, assuming your driveway is big enough to get it in. Um, in feed from the trailer, sieve cleaner again, gravity table here, and the seed treater is there. You can just see the, uh, the discharge uh, spout uh, from the evolution. And in front of that, the, um, 
the control screen for the operator. Uh, then the peristaltic pumps, you can see the yellow ones there, uh, and the bag off point there. And of course, in this case, uh, a generator in order to keep the whole lot running. <clears throat> So we've seen all the seed treaters, we've seen the processing plants, we've seen the pumps and the flow meters and so on and so forth. We, we get seed produced at the end of this. We need to know what's, what's happened, what the quality is. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, you look at the active ingredient with a loading analysis. We can look at the application quality so we know what it looks like. And then, of course, we can look at the dust. Let's. Um, First of all, think about our seed. How much chemical you've actually got on your seed? I'm going to refer to a product that unfortunately for many of you is no longer available. Um, but we'll look at cloth ironidin, which is the deter part of ready-go deter. Your label just says that. You have to go back to the seed plant to look at the product label to discover that it's got 250 grams per liter. Well, that's no good because you don't know how much how many liters are on the seed, but you then look elsewhere on the label and that says 200, 200 mils of product per 100 kilos, maximum individual dose load. So we now know it's 50 grams of cloth iodide in per 100 kilos of seed. So seed plants are analyzed at the laboratory, the seed samples are submitted by the processors, they send them in, usually from ordinary production runs, but sometimes if they're investigating an issue they've had on the seed plant, and uh, HPLC, high pressure liquid chromatography, um, sort of thing you see on any uh, image of a laboratory. And the loading results that that gives us, then calculate as a percentage of the target of the full amount. So when you've got all these load, loading results, obviously the first thing you do is you put them on a spreadsheet. Now this spreadsheet gets bigger and bigger. Uh, there can be over 700 results in a year. Uh, this contains all the information of who produced it, what variety it was, what the lot number was, what product was on it, and so on. And of course, what the loading result is. You take all the results and construct a histogram. That gives you a national figure. In this case, over 700 results. Uh, now, we have a target range there within which we're pretty certain that the product will perform as it says on the label. Um, obviously 100% is the maximum legal dose, but it will still work should you have to have a little bit over that. You can then interrogate the, the uh, spreadsheet to get the results for an individual processor. So the company can sit down and decide how it is performing against the national average, against the, fi the national figures. So there we have the active ingredient loading, but what about the quality? A visual assessment uh, is often used to describe the quality. Uh, and there are two parameters you look at. One is the evenness between one seed and another. So you've got two seeds, you look at how the color is between the two of them. And the patchiness or uniformity is the color distribution on the actual seed coat. So, this is the sort of remarks you'd get from the laboratory, very uneven, slightly patchy. But these are very uh, subjective results, and everyone looking at them will have a slightly different view of what that quality is. I mean, you have a go. Um, wheat seeds. Now, the one on the right, the one on the left. I don't know. The one on the right actually is very good, I think. It, 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 it's very even, and I would say quite uniform on the seed. The one on the left, it's quite patchy, isn't it? You know, you've got some quite patchiness on here, but is it very or slightly? Well, who can say? And then barley, of course, could be even worse because of the, the seed coat. Um, it does produce a fairly patchy view anyway. So we, a, a, some system was needed that would give us a quantifiable result. And this resulted, a lot of work with our, uh, with some uh, uh, colleagues from Leverkusen in Germany, produced a quality checker have a camera, put a seed sample under the camera, and that takes an image and analyzes the image and produces a color distribution graph such as this. So I'm not sure the full uh, uh, how it, it works uh, intimately, because that's what the boffins are meant to do, 
Um, however, I understand there's some grid system here and it looks at the color intensity on the, and the number of grids with that intensity. And you see, you've got a sample here. You can see actually under the picture here, the, the, the vertical um, uh, scale has changed. So here you've got a lot of samples with quite a high color intensity, which is good. And here you've got a big distribution of a low color intensity, which is bad. Some of you may have heard about dust, the Hoiback test, pronounced Hoiback, I'm reliably told. It was introduced in 2009, but I've included it here because this is discussing quality. And I think this is part of the quality assessment, even though it comes after what I'm coming on to in a moment. <clears throat> it became very important after the May, May seed uh, discussions that you'll see later on. And here you have a drive control unit. This contains a, a, a drive for this drive shaft here. It contains a, a, a pump, a vacuum pump and flow meters for the air supply. Now air goes down through this chamber here, which is rotating in way which you put your seed sample. It is then drawn through this chamber here, which is a glass cylinder, which collects any large maybe particles of chaff that may have been drawn through by the airflow here. There's then a filter unit that collects the fine floating dust. And that tube here then takes it back, which is uh, to the drive control unit, which is controlling the process. So it'll run for a fixed amount of time, for a fixed volume of air at a fixed speed. And then you weigh the filter unit to one microgram, which is, which is incredible. And, and the reason you have to have such accuracy is you've only got a hundred gram sample, um, and you need to be aware that any floating dust samples in your test, test room may add to the weight. So it needs to be a dust-free environment. But importantly, you need to keep the humidity right between the seed sample, the filter paper and the environment. So that you're not absorbing uh, moisture from the environment, and increasing your weight or maybe losing it to the environment and decreasing the result. So the sort of thing you'd get would be this. On the left, you see there's a small amount of dust, and on the right, there's more dust. And interestingly, we then came on to look at uh, some ready go deter uh, with, with and without co application. Uh, some of you may be, uh, know winter crop. Winter crop is a, is a plant nutrient, and um, it's, uh, it's particularly uh, significant in this issue because the growth of these plant nutrients, uh, and many people are applying more and more to seeds with little uh, uh, consideration for the result that it can have on the dustiness. And here you can see the dust on the right, the ready go deters four grams per 100 kilos. And on the left, it has trebled that amount, which is interesting, in my opinion. I thought it would be just be worth mentioning this, that uh, sea treaters are now part of the national sprayer testing scheme. Um, so they have to be tested uh, once they're five years old and retested after that every six years. So now I think we know everything there is to know about seed treatments. Let, now let's, let's come on to uh, uh, the bit that you may well have all been waiting for. In Germany, 2008, April and May, there were reports of bee deaths in Upper Rhine area. Appeared to be clinical symptoms of acute poisoning. No evidence of disease or parasites. The rapid response was organized uh, by Bayer and independent bodies to investigate what, what, had gone, what had gone wrong. And there were two things. One, quality of the maize seed treatment was very poor. You know, I was saying earlier about slurries. Uh, I understand that slurries were made up in this instance here. And they, there was a slurry mix which would include adhesive stickers. And it was applied to poncho to the seed. The seed was then required to be overtreated with poncho pro, and that was done without any further stickers. Now, it's never advisable to overtreat seed that's already been treated, but in this instance it was. Consequently, the seed treatment adhered very badly to the seed. But another thing from the engineering point of view, from an interesting point of view, agricultural engineers, was the design of the singling mechanism on the pneumatic suction drills. Now, some of you may be aware, uh, familiar with this. Um, 
on a suction drill, the airflow blows the abraded particles through this from this fan out into the atmosphere. Uh, you may know this is a singling disc with holes in through which air is drawn. As the seed is lifted up, one seed is held on to one hole. As it comes around here, the air suction is cut off and it drops into the, into the ground through the filter. Now, obviously, the air flowing through this hole will carry abraded particles with it, which are then exhausted through this fan. Vacuum singling drills, we just mentioned, other sorts of drills, pneumatic pressure. Well, that, uh, they select the seed mechanically. Mechanically, it's singled and blown into the soil with any abraded dust. Mechanical drills, well, they single the seed mechanically and it drops with any dust into the drill. So, okay, then it was decided to find out what you could do about all these drills that were out there that were blowing uh, in insecticide laden dust up into the air. So a test was, was, uh, was devised, drilling seed with the wind blowing across it, poles, sampling the air at certain heights, at certain distances from the seed drill, uh, using different types of drill. This is the results. Standard vacuum drill, four grams per hectare at one meter. It was decided to try conducting the exhaust air down onto the soil, modified airflow, reduced it to 5% by directing the exhaust air down onto the, onto the soil. Oh, sorry, let's go back to that, sorry. Um, air in the fertilizer, so putting the air down the fertilizer uh, tubes into the coulters, which reduced it down here. Um, Pneumatic pressure drills were down at that level as well, and mechanical selecting drills were down at that level as well. So you could pretty much say that the, that, that issue, we, it was known and understood what the problem was and how to sort it out. Very quickly, discussing with manufacturers, it came up with solutions. Amazon came up with a, a big foot there. Gaspardo had some deflector uh, uh, nozzles, dispersing nozzles on the end uh, of the exhaust. Uh, and then Monosem, interestingly, I mean, look where their nozzle is pointing straight vertically up in the air. Uh, that was deflected down <clears throat> to ground level. Now, this is all new machines. You have to consider all the machines out there that were already uh, on farms being used. <clears throat> so a simple method was de devised to allow the exhaust to be redirected with a simple manifold and pipe by farmers or local engineers. A system was rolled out in 2009. A uh, number of visits to a number of European countries. Uh, and it looked a little like this. You'd take a drill in this place, a Gaspardo drill. You can see the exhaust was there, but actually it's got a deflector. So most of the air would have come out to angle. Um, and then you devise a cardboard pattern to fit over the spout. And then from that cardboard pattern, you make yourself an aluminium manifold. And then, I know it's simple, but it works. Tech screws, fix it up, fix it on, spigot, pipe, T-piece, down to ground level. And that diverted the airflow, slowed down the airflow, and uh, resulted in very satisfactory results. So that's pretty much a solution to, to that. Uh, the problem was known about, the solutions were there, they were available. <clears throat> so let's go on just briefly. Um, to look at the neonic debate. Uh, I realize time is running on. I've got too enthusiastic, I can see. Um, and a little politics here, I guess. And we're all aware of the growth of, of uninformed debate, conspiracy theories and such like political lobbies around vaccinations, 5G, processed food, and of course, pesticides. Uh, I have to say, I think it's right that there should be robust monitoring of uh, business, business me methods of many of large organizations and their effects on society and the environment. But I think we must encourage a greater focus on the scientific research, particularly those of us who have a scientific um, background uh, and can find out or should make efforts to find out some of the information behind what's, what we're told. 
particularly uh, in areas where misrepresentation may be serious in, in agriculture. I mean, we know the world population is 7.8 billion at the moment, and we know that in the next 30 years, it's likely to be 9.5 billion or another 1.7 billion people to feed and water and clothe. So these are arguments, discussions that have very serious consequences. Let's have a look at some research, again, fairly briefly. There's a growing debate about the neonics. Uh, many of the laboratory studies were on, um, um, on, on insects um, being subjected to the neonics. And if you know that neonicotinoids are insecticide, will have an effect on insects, be they uh, predators or prey. Um, in the 2010s, there's growing debate and studies. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, to 2014, Bear and Syngenta decided that we needed to have some uh, more substantial field trials. And so they uh, took uh, commissioned the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to perform these uh, studies on orchid rape in Germany, Hungary and the UK. This was a large uh, study uh, and they found no consistent effects across the three countries, which is interesting. However, they chose the bold headline, damage confirmed, implying only negative effects. And of course, naturally, this was the press headline that was picked up on and, um, and that's what was run with. So let's have a little more closer look at the results, what actually happened, the results that they had in the depths of their report. 254 different parameters, 238 of those resulted in no significant differences. Oh, okay, so there's not a lot of difference. Nine showed a negative effect. Ah, ah so a negative effect. However, seven were more favorable to the colonies on the treated area. At no point in the publication did the authors acknowledge that 95% of the comparisons found no differences. The conclusions appear to be based solely on nine negative effects in only two countries, 3% of the data. Conversely, there's a number of large scale field trials that have been conducted in Europe and North Africa. Now, slightly contentious, neonic seed treatments do not pose a risk to bee health when used as recommended. Should that be a acceptable, unacceptable? I think everyone will understand, particularly in the COVID days, what that there are different appreciations of risk. And that's going to be a big discussion. So I did a bit of research just, just quickly. And uh, we're nearly there now. Pollinator decline studies. I thought, have a look on the work on the look on the internet, see what we can find. And I was really actually quite shocked. Honeybees disrupt structure and functionality of plant pollinator networks. Scientific uh, published in Nature um, in 2019. And another one here: conserving honeybees does not help wildlife in Science magazine in 2018. Now that's interesting actually, because if you put a large number of of, of, of generalist, super generalist species like the, the honeybee in an area, they will visit a large number of plant species with a high frequency. Uh, now this disrupts, disrupts the interactions of wild pollinators and, their, and plants that they naturally uh, will, will service for, for pollen and uh, for, for nectar. Uh, and this of course has an effect on their, on their survival. So that's the end of that, that political bit. Let me just, just run through briefly where I see the future. Sea treatment market, as you will know, has undergone enormous changes, less reliance on traditional plant protection products. Increasingly, we see nutrients growth enhancing biologicals, and there appears to be less emphasis put on quality of application. Any co-application testing is few and far between. Equipment development from the major crop protection manufacturers, which is what has spearheaded the equipment development in the last 40, 50 years, um, has been redirected. Grain handling manufacturers who have traditionally been involved in installing this sort of equipment, uh, they are, aren't product focused and they don't really have the teams to support advanced equipment. Some focus work is undertaken by small and medium engineers, engineering companies, uh, people like uh, Staptech in Yorkshire and STS Sea Treatment Services Ely, 
um, uh, involved with seed treaters uh, across the country to some degree. Then we have manufacturers, you see all European there, Norigard, Kimbria, who do turnkey seed plants, Nicholas, Sartek, Petkus, and uh, finally Bear Crop Science Limited, still manufacturing in the UK. So just in conclusion, I think we've seen the traditional seed treating technology and got to understand a bit about it. We've seen the developments of, of, um, of the equipment and the uh, metering systems. We've had a brief look at some of the seed plants and the mobile plants. We've looked at quality and we appreciate that now um, you have a problem uh, finding a seed sample that is less than satisfactory, certainly less than 50%. Whereas in 67, if you remember, 15% only were above 50%. And we've had a brief look at the neonic debate. Um, well, I hope that that's helped you to understand a bit of the uh, technology involved in seed treatment, seed treatment processing, uh, and appreciate the work done and the value added by seed processes. And I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, draw to a conclusion. Okay, uh, thank, thanks very much, Martin. That's a pretty comprehensive uh, view of seed, uh, overview of seed treatment. It's certainly uh, given me quite, quite a bit of information I'd, I'd no idea about. Um, and uh, there have been one or, one or two comments as, uh, as you've gone through. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just read one or two of those in case you've not had a chance uh, to pick up on them. But um, Alan Plom says, am I right in remembering stirring pink and dusty organomercury dressing seed into seed grain <laughs> by hand? <laughs> I guess that probably was something that was done. Quite lightly, quite lightly, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Yes, I'm, I, I've been in seed plants in the early days when the operator would be sitting there uh, rolling up his uh, his cigarette with his um, uh, hands uh, orange with Magama powder, uh, oh. merrily lighting the cigarette, lighting it, having just eaten his sandwiches, um, uh, which also turned slightly pink or orange as he ate them. Never yeah. done me any boy, he said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Bob Watson commented, you know, there was no PPE in those days. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, I suppose there's one thing that COVID's done for us. We know, all know now what PPE stands for. But um, has, well, I, I've got a question. If, uh, if there are others that want to ask questions, do please uh, un unmute your uh, camera or wave. I see James. Yeah, James Hunter. Um, wants to answer a question. James, you want to unmute your... There we go. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you are. Go ahead. Most interesting, Martin. Thank you very much for your presentation. You've had my undivided attention, but on my other computer, I haven't got the investment club in the background, but you've had <laughs> my attention. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> That's a compliment. Thank you. Yes. I live near Kim Bolton. <laughs> it wasn't you and in the field with a... It wasn't me. You know, I don't know who that one was, but I know Seabrooks had one. And I had one for very many years, too. Mm. It did the job. A um, couple of questions, really. Last autumn was a humbug. And we've had news coming around now that some of the seed treatments have affected the germination when it wasn't drilled last autumn. And people are going to have to stack up their um, seed rates. We've also had emails coming around from NSU and the HSE behind this as well, saying that some of the bags, having been left on the floor for a year, are uh, perishing and falling apart when they're being lifted up. Um, and my other comment is, how important is it to have a seed dressing on your grain? This day and age, we're all being talked about less chemicals in the environment, um, protection here and there where we can, safer for everything. And for the first time ever this autumn, our homestead wheat, which we're putting in on the farm, which is the vast majority of it, is having no chemical on it at all. I, I, I think we've taken away, sampled, analyzed, checked it in NIAB, and the agronomist is quite happy to just clean it, or have it cleaned, and put nothing on it. 
I, I think that's always been one of my uh, uh, feelings in the background for as far as uh, 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 seed treatments are concerned. I was always interested in the days when uh, seed was supplied with a single purpose treatment on, and yet the farmers would expect to pay for it to control a seedborne disease that had occurred on someone else's farm. It seemed slightly strange there. If you are having home stage seed, then you can grow it quite satisfactorily for a year, maybe two years. But um, I hesitate to, 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 to suggest that you may remember the years when we had uh, you know, loose smut showing in ears in, in barley. Um, um, but it doesn't take long for that initial um, uh, uh, inoculum in the plant to build up if you're uh, growing from year to year. And now, I mean, I should be careful here because I, I, I'm an engineer, <laughs> not a, a, a biologist or botanist. So I'm sure your, your advisor will know better than I. But I know you can have seed tested uh, for seedborne diseases. Um, and then there's no particular reason unless you want to control um, uh, you know, the, the subsequent uh, pests or diseases that may come in uh, post, post drilling, bearing in mind that it may, if you can use a, a successful seed treatment, that may need, mean, mean you have less need to go in and spray. And that's always been one of the problems, particularly this time of year. And at the moment, unless you've got a paddle steamer, you aren't going anywhere, I think. No, it's, it's pretty moist. Yeah. We couldn't say very wet. Um, another drawback, not getting at you at all, but another drawback with most treatments over the years is the coating on the seed has, has, has smothered the seed, let's say, and the germination has always been slower. On a dry year, quite considerable. I know we won't have them this year, but um, we do use them, of course we use them, but at the moment, this year, we've had ours tested and we're not. I, I would very much see seed treatment as, as a tool. Um, I mean, you're obviously being very, very, very sensibly approaching the uh, the argument and looking at, at your at your options, which is the right way to do it. I think there's no, you know, you must do this, you must do that. If you've got a good, clean uh, sample and you know it's going into a good seed bed, then then why not? But I, I leave it to the biologist to argue over that one. Um, I would just say that as far as seaborne diseases are concerned. It is a matter of building up from, from year to year. Um, but you set your seed treatment according to how, how, how you see the, 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 the year that's coming, uh, if you have your crystal ball in operation. Yes, okay. thank you very much. Okay. And lovely to see all those pictures. I've never been around a seed processing plant or a big one. It's been lovely to see it. Thank you very much. Well, I, I mean, that was really the, the, the point. Many people who sit out there, I, I talk to people about seed processing and they have no idea what goes on behind the closed doors of a seed plant. Bearing in mind, there's still maybe one or two that possibly not quite as advanced as some of the ones I showed. Um, but, uh, you know, it was really to show what is available. And um, of course, it's debatable. We may actually have sufficient technology um, to last us for some years, if, if you see what I mean. There may, we may have advances, uh, advanced as far as the agricultural farming business requires in this country for high volume crops like cereals and or seed rape. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks for that, that question, uh, James. Um, can I just uh, pose one, uh, uh, Martin? Um, you, you told or you showed that uh, a, a dye is, I, I believe, applied to the seeds and and the the measure of the effectiveness of the treatment seemed to be relying on the distribution of the dye well is that am i understanding that correctly and if so how can you relate that to the <clears throat> the actual coating with the chemicals or chemicals that you're using yeah. no i think you you have misunderstood there if you are using a slurry mix then yeah. you may be adding a, a, a colour coating to enhance the colour or to identify it. Virtually all the seed treatments in this country are pre-supplied um, uh, water-based suspensions that will already have the colour incorporated in it. All oh, right. Yeah. One of the alternative early ways we had of measuring application quality was actually to look at the colour. And then we had to consider, going back to the original batches, what the actual color inclusion rate was against the actual active ingredient rate of that each individual lot. So there are issues if you want to accurately use color 
to, to measure it, but on the seed samples that we've seen on cereal seeds, the color was part of the seed treatment as it was supplied. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, if anybody else, any questions? Could they raise their hand or unmute themselves? Uh, Alan. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say, I, I turned my video off because of my um, unstable link. Um, James knows all about that until he got his new connection, I think. But uh, yeah, no, th thanks for raising that point. It, it took me back and uh, yeah, no mention of stirring by hand there, Martin. But, <laughs> It was good seeing all those various devices. Um, I, just one other safety question, really, and sorry about that, but that's what I'm paid to do. Um, in terms of uh, the various devices and where you are now, is there any greater or lesser risk of um, explosion or from static and so on? Well, actually, that is an interesting point because one of the things we had to consider when CE marking the um, batch treaters is, of course, the volume of, of grain uh, inside the, the the mixer and a number of tests were performed both in considering that a a dust explosion needs to be an explodable dust uh, not every dust will form an explosion it has to be um, a combustive explosive powder so if you've got something like sugar or flour uh, such things they, they can explode um, now if you start to treat seed, the first thing you're doing is putting water on it. All of these machines have a, a mix abort timer on them. So we consider the, the volume inside the mixing chamber, uh, the fact we're adding water, the fact there is a mix abort timer on them, and then actually measure the buildup of dust in the mixed chamber. And we found that they're within uh, operational parameters, there's no risk of explosion um, unless an operator pretty much decides he wants to try and make one. Um, but uh, you know, then he's got to leave the seed grinding in the mixing chamber for half an hour before you, you could have any thought of, of any issues. I, 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 use that, I use that half an hour as a, as a rough rule of thumb, but it has been measured, the dust build up and all this sort of thing. So in that handling, but certainly in seed plants and grain handling plants, you'd know um, these explosive environments has to be considered. No, thank you. I, I think probably what, what caught my eye was the number of um, hazard notices that are plastered all over machines these days, but that's a more defensive perhaps from the lawyers than anything else. But there you go. Uh, uh, we could have an interesting discussion on CE marking and, uh, and, and the uh, risk assessments involved, I'm sure. Yeah, but that would be for thank another day. Anybody else a, a question that they'd last, like to ask? I see. Uh, is that David White who just appeared on the screen? Yes. Hello there. Did, did you have a question, David, or is it just... Uh, uh... No, sorry, you need to unmute yourself, David. The absolute classic of uh, the COVID era, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, I find it fascinating. It's not really my subject area, but um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for a, a great evening. And I'm glad I uh, took the opportunity to uh, come along and listen via Zoom rather than in person, because that's one that's one of the sort of benefits, as you might say, that um, I think that you can get a wider audience from people who wouldn't normally attend. Mm. Yes, I think we've, we've we've got a, quite a quite a number of participants tonight, as you can probably all see. So that that um, I, I'm sure it exceeds our normal uh, physical meeting held in uh, Malden Church Hall. So <laughs> that's been a great success from that, that point of view. Um, can I just ask another thing, or, or perhaps you could repeat a, something you said earlier about the electrostatic flow meter? Oh, yes. How does that actually work? Does it rely on some aspect of the or, or some feature of the substance to be able to measure that. Yeah, well, it, it's um, it, it, it's Faraday's law. If you pass a conductor through a magnetic field, you get a voltage. Right. And the conducting, the fluid is the conductor. So it has to be a conductive fluid. Ideally, water is, is where you start with. But the seed treatments we are using are generally water based. Uh, we have they have to be assessed really because some um, of the 
some of the products being brought in now, particularly as nutrients, are chelated. And uh, again, I'm not a chemist, but as I understand, these have a, a uh, pH of zero or one, highly right. acidic, right. Um, right. and can cause all sorts of problems in process equipment, in metering systems. But then, of course, if you're producing a, a chelated uh, manganese or something, then um, you're not too worried. You can just sell it to the seed processor and tell them to get on with it. Um, but people who design and manufacture equipment have to consider. So all the parts have to be replaced by stainless steel and so on. But it does mean you have to consider if it's electrically conductive, if you want to use it with a flow meter. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so that is the consideration. If it's electrically conductive, when it flows through the magnetic field, it produces a voltage relative to the velocity of the fluid. Right, right. Yeah. Now, as I understand it, it doesn't have to be a Newtonian fl flow. It, it, it can be, you know, it can be an uneven flow through the tube because it takes the average uh, velocity across the pipe. Right, right. Okay, thanks very much for that. Is it any anybody else got a, a, a question, or are we? I can't see everybody, so yeah. if you have got a question, you need to, uh, and those we can't see, you need to unmute yourselves. No, no, I can't see any waves or anything from anybody else. So, um, yeah, just uh, to thank you very much in, in, indeed again, Martin, uh, for your presentation this evening. It's been very wide ranging, um, fascinating subject, but uh, I have to say, yeah, was aware of seed treatments, but had got no idea of how they were actually applied and all the complications and technology that, that surround that process. So it's, it's been a, a really interesting evening and thank you very much in, indeed again. And um, I yeah, raise my hands to you and um, <laughs> thank you very much in, in the normal okay. way. And uh, thank you very much everybody else who has attended. I say you've, uh, you know, I can see a lot of claps on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a brilliant way of showing it. Thank you. And uh, well, we, we look forward to um, seeing you again, um, audience that is, um, when we get round to announcing our, our next meeting in our, in our series. But for, for the moment, thank you very much, everybody. Have a, an enjoyable rest of your evening.